certainly some people thought there were some other things happening that you and I have not discussed. So, I believe that the first bill that we're starting on is um, House Bill 2784. And unfortunately, because of different things that occurred during this session, we're having to bundle some bills, as you are well aware of. So in 2784, which is the CCRC bill, and I believe the Senate added language to include Home Plus, and we're willing to accept that amendment, uh, then we would include uh, House Bill 2751, which is the KDADS day service provider. House Bill 2578, which is the CCBHC with the sunset, three-year sunset on it. And then 2777, which was the fire marshal body camps. That's our proposal, Madam Chair. We were asking, is that the fire marshal bill as amended? What was your amendment, Madam Chair? I don't have that in front of me. Remember. Eileen. I believe you had something about still shots or something like that. Was right. That Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the amendment to 2777 would prohibit video cameras and audio recordings, but would not prohibit still photographic images of violations that are found during an inspection. Um, visiting with my colleagues here, I'm not sure that we're comfortable with those amendments, Madam Chair. Oh. This was requested by the fire marshal, and I believe it was 100% in our committee, and it was passed on our floor. I'm sure it was requested by the fire marshal, but this is a decision that gets made by the legislature. It does not get made by him. I guess we're trying to understand, Madam Chair, when you find a violation, that's what the fire marshal is supposed to do, right? When they come in and do an inspection, they're supposed to find a violation. You're saying they're not allowed to take a photo of the violation? Not at this time. It's my understanding, Madam Chair, that the federal government has taken heed to what's happened in Kansas with this body cam issue and that they will be coming out with new regulations or recommendations here within the next few months. And I'd rather, we'd rather wait to see what those recommendations are and then we could come back next year if we needed to add the still photos. Um, let me just ask, Eileen, currently are, the, are they allowed to take, I would think, they would take photos of violations. I don't believe there's a prohibition on it, so I think I think it is still current practice. So they could still currently do that. We could just take out the amendment as it's stated. Are you all in agreement with that? Eileen, um, without the amendment in 2777, would the fire marshal's um, office still be able to take uh, a video with um, audio as, as well as still pictures?
So 2777 would place a prohibition on video and audio recording. Because 2777 puts that prohibition in current law, then working backwards would mean that they are allowed to take video and audio and still photographic images currently. So I guess the question is, and so if 2777 was amended into this uh, uh, group of bills in the without the amendment, that would be a prohibition against um, against audio and and uh, audio and video recordings. That's correct. Yes, um, if we strike the Senate amendment, the bill would return to. The, the state without the allowance for still photographic images. Thank you. We agree with that, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And the next bill we have, Madam Chair, is House Bill 2547, which was the school emergency a bill, and I believe that on your side of the ch your chamber, remove the liability provision, and we would like to see that amendment stricken. We think that individuals that are required to uh, deal with this need to be exempt from liability because they're operating under consent. Madam Chair, upon further review, um, we would agree with you in that we discovered there are many schools that don't have a school nurse, and that is regarding non-medical school personnel. And um, so we, I do have an amendment that just restores that language. Okay. And then we would also include House Bill 2596, which is the, uh, the pharmacy schedule. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have an amendment to that, too. So we'll do this one first, and then we'll go to that one. If that's okay with you, Madam Chair. On which one? 2547? Just restoring the language. And Jenna, would you explain? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, House, the Senate offer on House Bill 2547 restores the immunity um, Lang the immunity provision um, that was stricken um, in subsection B. The only change um, that was made by our office was a technical amendment changing the word gratuitously to without compensation to align with the immunity protections for healthcare providers in KSA 652891. So, Jenna, my question to you would be is this doesn't impact because they're paid by the school, is that correct? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. It should not impact who they are paid by. This language includes um, that employs or contracts such person. We'll accept it, Madam Chair. And then the next bill that was mentioned, I believe, was 2596. And we have an, a, just, again, a simple member, amendment to that. We Jenna, could say, you explain? We never say simple because that means it's going to get a, become a cluster. <laughs> okay, I think it's like eight words. Simple, easy, <laughs> none of that matters. <laughs> Do you have an amendment for us? Um, thank you, Manager. I don't have a paper amendment. Um, this is language. Um, Senator Erickson can explain who it's from, and then I'll explain the amendment. Thank you. Um, so... This amendment was brought to us by KBI to address a misalignment of nomenclature in the Controlled Substances Act. And it does not change in any way what is currently controlled in the statute. It just updates the naming of it to reflect more updated language that they use in the laboratory as it relates to these substances. And this would um, be on House Bill 2556 in uh, subsection, or excuse me, 2596, sorry. Uh, this would be in subsection H, um, paragraph one, in the definition of tetrahydrocannabinols, which is THC. This would be line 34 of the bill. It would change delta one to delta nine. 
line 35 changing delta 6 to delta 8 and then line 36 would change delta 3 comma 4 to delta 6a comma 10a did the kbi have this conversation with uh blazy with the pharmacy board i madam chair i'm not aware of any conversation around that they just asked me to update the keep it to consistent in the nomenclature so i i do not know any additional conversations that were had i think madam chair i would be uncomfortable doing that without hearing from uh blazy on that so it would be my recommendation that we pass the bill as we passed it in the house we could have a conversation with her between now and omnibus and we could fix it at that time because the KBI did not visit with the House on that. We're fine with that, Madam Chair. Okay. I believe the next one is yours, Madam Chair. 287? Okay. Read Senate Bill 287. And, um, Madam Chair, we would recommend that we insert the contents of 219. And if, would you give us a quick brief, um, Jenna, on 219? I can probably give. Um, Senate Bill 219 is the rural emergency hospital provision that would expand the definition of rural emergency hospital if the federal legislation is passed, expanding it from 2015 to 2020. Whereas right now, a rural emergency hospital would have had to meet those criteria on that specific date in December 2020. So basically, what the feds did is when they passed their rural hospital bill last year, they did not grandfather any of those in that had already right sized themselves. So this puts in provisions so that as soon as the feds get that passed, which we know our delegation is diligently working on, that it would be able to be triggered and not wait for us to come back next year and to pass legislation. We are fully in agreement, and I'm thinking of Fort Scott Hospital that this could help. Yes, ma'am. Then we'd be looking at um, Senate Bill 20, or House Bill 2579. And that is the, uh, the EMS over-the-counter Mm -hmm. uh, legislation. And we do have an amendment for that that was brought to us from the Department of EMS. And that was part of their neutral testimony on our side that we missed it in committee because it was written only. But since meeting with them, uh, we have a, an amendment. I won't call it simple. Uh, Jenna, can you address that amendment? And we discussed that with Representative Reese just before this meeting because I know she'd been working with them. She was aware of it. The proposed amendment would add in um, the statute KSA 6516-127, and that is the statute um, related to um, emergency opioid antagonists, so the Narcan, um, when an individual or um, healthcare provider is administering it to an individual. There's current language in that statute about a first responder. Um, it authorizes them to possess, store, and administer the emergency opioid antagonist. And this would add the language distribute so that it would align with the provisions of the bill. So the bill allows the EMS provider to distribute the over-the-counter medicine, which includes the emergency opioid antagonist. And this would add it um, to the statute KSA 65-16-127. We're fine with the amendment, Madam Chair. Lastly, Madam Chair, we would like to include um, Senate Bill 3 or substitute for Senate Bill 352, and we would like to discuss a couple of compromises. Okay. One of the things that um, we had talked about is, I think, 
the concerns for both chambers is, you know, we have a lot of hurt families from patients who were not able to have visitors during COVID. And so nobody wants to see that happen again. And the concern about the, la the current language in the house version is end of life care. And the concern on our side is end of life care. You may have somebody who's 18, you could have somebody who's 69, it does not matter. But particularly with, with elderly people, the more they are left alone without visitors, the more likely they are to become end of life at the end of life care. They kind of give up. So that was the concern about using that language of end of life care, as does that really address the situation or could that be that somebody's been waiting to visit their loved one and they're like, okay, they, they've got maybe today, maybe they have a few hours so left, so we'll let you go in and see them. I believe that in the discussions within our committee, we felt comfortable that this does take and protect them because that was also a concern for us. So what we had, what we passed advanced out of committee is what we felt covers that. And can you explain how that covers that kind of medically? Maybe Dr. Epley, could you address that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we did discuss the terminology at some length in our committee and we had had earlier on the uh, wording of uh, uh, terminal care in there and terminal care can last sometimes if you're Rosalind Carter for two years. I mean, so that was not our intent with this bill. We want people to be there at the end of life and end of life is a judgment call by the providers uh, present. And um, normally it's anywhere from a few days to a few hours and it depends on the clinical setting, the situation. And we thought end of life is, a, is the consistent terminology used right now uh, for people who are dying and active dying can take anywhere from a couple of days typically to a few hours, but it would cover that period of time. And uh, you can get lost in semantics if you have too many terms in there. And that's why we actually took out the word terminal care and, and, left, and put consistent wording in with end of life care. Um, Senator. Thank you for that representative. And again, I think you were talking about nomenclature. I think the difference may be it's no patient left alone, as opposed to no dying patient left alone, just no patient left alone. So you have an 18 year old, you have a 25 year old, and they're like, we don't allow any visitors. They may not necessarily be at the end of their life care, but they were not allowed to have visitors, parent, patients, or people talking about having to be outside the room and having to look in a window and not being able to be with a loved one and they weren't necessarily at end of life care. We have somebody on our committee right here that had that situation with the loved one. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think we're talking about two different clinical situations mm -hmm. here. And you know, that, that kind of defers to the visitation policies of the facility. And I don't think it's, the intent of this bill is not nor I think 352 to get into the visitation policies of each hospital and whether they're a pediatric hospital or they're an adult care hospital or they're a hospice facility or whatever, because you can get lost in the terminology and the semantics, if you will. I think this is meant to be at the end of life care. And that's, that's what the heartfelt testimony that I heard. And I did listen to it from your Senate hearings and they were heartfelt. And those were individuals that were dying and at the end of life. And we need to take that into account. And we need to have a bill that's functional and workable with the facilities so they can work with their visitation policies to let people in there at the end of life. And I may not be following your situation. On 18-year-old or 25-year-old, if they're at the end of life, they should have family present with them at the end of life if the uh, caregivers uh, are able to determine that. And again, I think we're talking about, you're right, we're talking about two different situations, but yet they both would, could work together in that. Again, we're talking about what happened in COVID. People were kept from loved ones, not necessarily at the end of care, just people that weren't allowed to have to see anyone. They couldn't have any visitors uh, that could go in the room with them, be in the room with them of any age, and they weren't necessarily at end of life care. They just were not, not allowed to have visitors. So the, the original bill that we had on the Senate side addressed anyone in medical care. The definition was different than end of life care. And that's the one compromise that we would ask for, is to change that definition. Th 
Thank you, Senator Gossage. And uh, Madam Chair, may I address? So again, I, I think we can lose the intent of the bill and, and of the, even the John D. Springer Act in 352 if we broaden that definition too much. Um, I think um, we need to rely on our healthcare facilities to make those determinations on who should be present. I mean, right now in the ICU setting, I can tell you there's a lot of people who are critically ill and uh, for, for health reasons and for reasons that, I mean, clinical situations that we could go on and on about, uh, it's not appropriate to have loved ones there at the bedside right at that time because of procedures going on or whatever. And, and, and the intent of this bill was mainly directed at post, our post-COVID experience with people that were dying. And that's why it should be no patient left alone at the end of death uh, act. And, and that's what all the testimony that I heard from the, from the Senate was on folks that were at the end of life. And I think if we wade into the hospital rules and regulations on visitation on uh, who visits and when they get to visit and how long, I think we'll lose the intent of the bill. Uh, this is meant at the end of life to direct those facilities to, uh, to, to provide loved ones, to provide family members, guardians, whatever, at the bedside when someone is uh, felt to be at the end of life and dying. And again, I just think, not to belabor this, but I think there, that may have been the vision on your side. The vision on our side was not to interfere with every single visitation policy because it does allow for, you know, if they're in intensive care, or if, you know, for what for another reason they weren't able to have visitors, of course, that would be allowed. Um, but the definition of patient would mean an individual who's receiving care or at a resident of a medical care facility. And the definition on the house side was changed to say an individual in end of life care is the definition of patient. Senator, if you direct me to your definition in 352, I've got the bill open and I'm trying to find it here. I'm sorry, I was looking at the supplemental note on page two. I could go to the bill itself if you prefer. Page one, line 20 of the bill itself medical care facility, and then it goes down to line 22. Patient means an individual who's receiving care at or is a resident of a medical care facility. So then it covers the patient. Right, That this was the definition we had in the Senate bill right. in 352. The definition that's on the House side is only for end of care, for the definition of patient. Patient would mean an individual is receiving end-of-life care at a patient care facility. So is it your intentions, Madam Chair, to cover all patients, irregardless of what they're in a facility for, not just into life care or terminal care or something that comes up? That so if they go in because they're, you know, receive, maybe they've got to stay in the hospital for a couple of days, that you want to be able to have a person in there? That, you know, again given the medical situation, which is why in the Senate bill we allowed for, unless they're in intensive care, unless there's a, a, another medical reason uh, for them not to be able to have patients, rather than a federal guideline that says no patients because of this, which is what we saw before. Representative Epley. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I'll do my best here. Uh, Senator, I think uh, the point is uh, our, our facilities, our healthcare facilities, hospitals, hospices, uh, 
they have visitation policies for people that are not in the ICU and they're adhered to, and I'd never been aware of any issues or problems in that situation. And again, I did listen to your testimony, and those were folks that were dying. Those were people that had COVID and were passing away from COVID. In, and, in all due respect, they weren't all. Okay, well, uh, they they were critically ill, and, and, and I, to my knowledge, they all passed away uh, in there, the testimony. Yes, there were some that were passed away. And, you know, again, this was a time during a pandemic where uh, there was no visitation allowed, and they were all advancing towards end of life. So, you know, it gets definitional on, on how you want to look at that, uh, Senator. And so I, I would say we'll lose the intent of the bill if we broaden this to all clinical situations for healthcare facilities. I mean, I can't speak for all of them, but they have visitation policies currently. We've never had a problem with any visitation in those facilities other than during the, the COVID pandemic. We agree. And, and during the COVID pandemic, it was... Uh, extraordinary times, and and uh, <laughs> we can reflect on that for hours at, for on end. But this is designed for patients. Uh, both, I think, the John D. Springer Act and this Act are are very similar in their aspirations to make sure that when people are critically ill at the end of life, that we have family members present with them, uh, or loved ones, or guardians. And I think if we broaden this to other clinical situations or circumstances, it 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 doesn't um, it doesn't win the day. It doesn't get us to where we need to be with the the COVID pandemic. I think. And again, I would just say that on the Senate bill side, that we were looking at any patient, and that is not allowed to have a, a loved one with them. It does not matter if they're 25 or at the end of their life, but they're just in the hospital and they're not allowed to have somebody with them. And they could have been in the hospital for several days um, and not allowed to have uh, anybody visit with them. So that's why it was, you know, the no patient left alone. Yes, Mrs. Springer, her husband did die. You're absolutely right. But we also heard in that, in testimony, and also in working the bill, of uh, folks who said, you know, they had young people that they had to sit out there, sit out in the window or sit outside and try to talk to them through the window. So again, we're not talking about every situation. We're not talking about intensive care or a medical situation where they couldn't have somebody with them. But in just we just don't want this to happen again. Representative Ruiz. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I talking with hospitals, um, and this was a... a, a an unusual I know. time, you know, with the pandemic. And, I, and I, can, I feel like I can say with all confidence that hospitals have gone back, you know, not with hindsight, of course, and because of bills like this and if because of, of, you know, just all the news that was out there about folks that were, were dying alone. Um, and um, they have gone, I think, above and beyond now and have revised their patient visitation rules, taking into account that they don't, they also don't want to see people left alone. Doesn't matter the age. And, and I think everybody knows from hospitals to schools to everywhere that we uh, might have gone a little bit more than what we should have with all of our rules and regulations. I feel very confident with the hospitals that I've been in touch with that they have made some flexibility in their in their uh, visitations uh, rules, um, and that you know I feel much better about about those rules now and feeling that people are not going to be denied to be seen by their loved one, no matter what stage of medical care they might be getting. What I, what I very much like about this bill is it really does look at a specific situation of the end of life and, and, what, and how that might be defined by a provider uh, or a hospital that they in particular will get to see the people that love them and that want to be by their side um, as, they, as they go on to their journey. Um, and so I think this bill very much complements that. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great bill to have in addition to what the hospitals are all, have already done with 
making changes in their in their rules and reg well more their policies regarding visitation and i think they've all have seen that that needed to happen and they and i really feel like they've done that thank you madam chair representative um senator erickson thank you madam chair to me this is an issue of humanity and i hope and pray that the hospitals have taken this to heart and if they have, they should have no problem with what we're proposing here on the Senate side. And this gets very personal to me as my son was in a hospital room. I was not able to see him. I was not able to touch him. Um, there's so much more. And end of life, absolutely. We all agree on that. But I know he would have had a better recovery, a quicker recovery, if, if I could have been with him, if I could have held his hand and calmed him down from his anxiety in that situation. So I think there's something to be said about what about patient well-being and recovering when surrounded by loved ones. And, and I never want anyone to have to go through what we've gone through, and this just safeguards that in my mind. This is a hum it's a humanitarian uh, issue, in my opinion. And we've seen what happens, and um, I would like to trust but verify through this bill that it will not happen again. Thank Madam you. Chair. Thank you. Representative Epley. Just one more optic I want to give you, and think about this. Before the COVID pandemic, did we ever hear about any visitation issues or, or issues of patient care and not being able to see our loved ones in the hospital, whether it was in a hospice facility or the regular floor or um, uh, an ICU setting or, or a CCU? No, you never heard any issues. I personally have worked in the ER many, many times, many nights, when we're doing a code blue on people and we ask the family to come in and they can monitor and observe what we're doing to try to save their loved one. We all always did that, but that was turned completely upside down during the COVID pandemic because we weren't allowed to have anyone present anywhere because of the infectious disease aspects of this disease, right or wrong, and we can rant and rave and go on that for hours on end, and I don't want to do that. But, you know, that's what we, those were the guidelines we were given, and so we had to play by new rules then at that point in time. We're no longer under a pandemic, and, you know, heaven forbid if we would come under another pandemic, those rules might come into play again, depending on, I mean, you know, you hear about the bird flu right now. That could become an issue for us. And so, again, we would have be subject to new rules and regulations from CDC and from CMS, some of which people don't want to hear about and be made aware of. But I think that this bill is designed for folks at the end of life. And that was when we saw the horrible issues. Now, I appreciate that we're not happy. We're we're angry about the fact we couldn't be with our loved ones during the COVID pandemic. But the facts are we're, we're not in a pandemic right now and I don't think we're going to be in the near future and that the current visitation policies, I assure you, are very liberal. They're very uh, patient-centric and I'm not aware of any problems. If, if anyone's aware of any problems before 2000, and 20 before the pandemic started, I'd like to hear about that because I was never made aware of any visitation policies until the COVID pandemic. And, you know, that changed. And now we're back to business as usual. And I don't think we're going to have any more visitation issues in the other situations that you're alluding to, uh, Senator. So that, I'm just trying to explain this from a medical standpoint. Thank you. Uh, and I would just say and we have two committee members that were supposed to be somewhere else for their for their other conference committees. I didn't want to belabor this either. But as I went through 352 and put side by side the House bill and marked the differences, there were several differences. One was a patient bill of rights that was in the Senate bill. The other was a $25,000 civil lawsuit possibility. And the only thing we were asking for as far as a compromise is the definition of patient.
Madam Chair, what if about yeah. on, pay, on line, page one, line 17, mm -hmm. uh, we remove end of life. So it would read patient means an individual who is receiving care at a patient care facility. And Could you say the line again, please? Line 17 on page one. Patient means an individual who is receiving care at a patient care facility and. So we remove the words end of life. We were in agreement. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee. So we're good on so are We are. In agreement on 287. On, with those. on 287, with adding the contents of 2579 as amended, 219 and 352 as amended. Yes, ma'am. And then the uh, next bill that we'll work on is 2531, and we would insert... I'm not quite, if we, quite sure if we want to call it 371 because the House had some angst on the idea of silver alert and ID mm -hmm. being under the same alert. So we would like to insert that IDD would have their own alert. So I, however the revisers, I love doing this to Jenna, I drive her crazy when I do this, is wherever it's a silver alert that it would be ID, IDD alert then if we find out that there is a fiscal note between now and omnibus, then we can deal with it in the uh, omnibus appropriations bill. Um, of course, 371 does not do that. So the, they, it allows them to be a part of the silver alert. And I think we're fine with looking at that in the future. Um, House is not in a position now to include IDD population into the silver alert because we think it will confuse the public. We are in agreement that the IDD deserves their own alert. Mm -hmm. So basically that's what we are willing to do is to allow them to have their own alert system just designed exactly like the silver alert. So if I understand the instructions I need for the revisers is to look at the silver alert language and put IDD alert in there. And of course, and we would come back at omnibus and look and see if there's a fiscal note to be addressed with it at that time. And are you saying if because we were told there would be a large fiscal note, but we don't know what that is? Nobody's and I know when we provided that at this time, and we're willing to take that that on, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. I appreciate that. So, uh, of just giving the background in this committee of what happened in our Senate committee, that when they initially brought it to us in the hearing, that we asked that they have their own and could they look into having their own. And then the when the IDD community came back to us along with the Sheriff's Department and along with the Attorney General's office and all agreed that this would work for them to be part of the silver alert and that it would be to a, a higher fiscal note for that. Again, I don't know what that fiscal note is, Madam Chair. Um, and if Jenna, no, if Jenna has some language about that, because the main thing is we have the IDD alert, right? Yeah. That's the goal we all want to get to. But I think that it muddies the waters for the silver alert because that's for elderly. Well, I, the IDD should have their own alert. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree and more. And the silver alert is a state function, unlike mm -hmm. the Amber alert, which is a federal function. Correct. I agree with that, Madam Chair. Jenna loves surprises. Okay, maybe not, Jenna. She already smiled. Madam Chair, can we agree in concept then without the language or not? Let me get a nod from Jenna because she's the one that's going to have to draft it. That we agree, agree with concept, and then you can draft it accordingly, and then we can look at it before we sign the report. Yes. And I can send it out to the committee members as well when yes, I please. get the balloon drafted. Okay. okay. Senator Petty. Um, I didn't know if this would add to the thinking process about this whole thing, but um, it appears that over 20 states have added IDD to their silver alert, so we wouldn't be the first. Madam Chair, I have, like to be a leader. <laughs> I have a suggestion. Perhaps we can pull this from this
conference committee. We have a little time here. Let's see if we can hear back on a fiscal note on this, on the um, for them having their own alert, because obviously they've been notified as we've been working on this bill. Then we could come back together on 2531. Are you in agreement with that? I'm fine with that, Madam Chair. Okay. So then we're done on all of our other bills except for uh, 2531. Well done. All right. Well done, committee. Thank you, Madam Chair.